good evening friends uh, greetings from cochin to all the viewers across the country i am dr sai kumar uh, i am the president of the cochin of salmi club and it gives me great pleasure to uh, organize uh, such a webinar on the opd and the ot strategies that we need to follow in this difficult covid times we have an extremely distinguished panel Uh, of speakers with us today uh, without wasting much time uh, i request dr gopal who is the professor of ophthalmology at amrita institute he is also the secretary of the cochin ophthalmic club to take over the proceedings to introduce the speakers to the audience and then we'll start with the talks gopal please thank you very much sir uh, it's a pleasure this is the third uh, covid symposium that cochin of the medical club is hosting over the last two months and uh, now we are in phase 4 of the lockdown and probably uh, after a few more days you know our work will be back to normal and uh, it is always up to us to actually see that we are safe and we are also able to give our patients what they uh, come for and definitely we will have an overwhelmingly increased number after the lockdown is over and it is up to us to look at how things are going to be and all india ophthalmic society uh, they have come up with a wonderful 100 page guidelines and protocols on to how ophthalmologists should be uh, you know taking care of ourselves during this covid times so this symposium again is another effort to recreate the same thing and answer all your questions whatever it may be you can just ask us and we will put it to the distinguished panel we have with us today Dr. Mahipal Singh Sachdev, who is the president of the All India Ophthalmic Society, he is also uh, he has he is running the Center for Sight, the corporate multiple branches. So so business is very very important to him. So he will be looking at that angle also. Dr. Lalit Verma is the vice president of the uh, All India Ophthalmic Society, a distinguished retinal surgeon, teacher, and my mentor. Uh, Dr. R. D. Ravindran is the chairman of qualities in Arvind Eye Hospital, director and chairman of quality in Arvind Eye Hospital, and uh, uh, Dr. Kaushik Murli is the president of the Shankara Eye Care Group of Institutions. We have Mohan Aip sir, who is uh, the uh, former medical superintendent of the M G M Muthoot Medical Center, one of the senior most ophthalmologists and administrators in Kerala, also. Uh, very soon we will be joined by dr namrata sharma the honorary secretary of the aios and she is a professor at the rp center which is the largest government hospital in the country to look at government perspectives as well so it will be moderated by dr shashi kumar shashi kumar sir the past president of the ksos a senior ophthalmic surgeon in kerala and uh, dr sai kumar who is the president of the cochin ophthalmic club a distinguished cataract surgeon in kerala over to first of all let us uh, hear out how in the opd we can uh, what what all strategies that we use in the opd to counter these covid times over to you my pal sir Ipal, you are muted. Muted. But all of us, all of the other people, can mute themselves. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gopal, and thank you very much, President and other members of the Cochin Ophthalmic Club. Uh, we are indeed passing through difficult times, and uh, COVID has uh, really changed the way we think and how things are going to be. now and in future so what i normally say is that there is going to be a new normal for ophthalmic practice so obviously uh, as are the signals uh, the uh, country is likely to open up it's already opened up a little bit and i think from monday onwards uh, the each individual state uh, would possibly be deciding as to how much and where all they have to open up so uh, obviously uh, the government of india has come out with guidelines from time to time state being a health subject the states also come out with a 
uh, with the guidelines from time to time. So uh, we were as ophthalmologists slightly confused as to what we were to do and what we were not to do. And then the All India Ophthalmological Society actually uh, uh, took in the opinion of experts and that numbered about 220 experts both nationally and internationally. And uh, we uh, brought out a set of guidelines, which is here, which you know has been released about uh, on Monday. It was released actually Sunday, Monday night. And uh, these were specific to ophthalmology, but uh, the simple thing that was there was that it is not a substitute for clinical judgment and regulatory mandates and ethical mandates for the state and the, and the government of India. It was basically to inform, guide, but it is not a rule to supersede the local governmental rules that are there. And it is a collective effort of experts. Uh, so that is what we had. And we had more than 12 subspecialties that were being looked into. And I would uh, be really uh, failing in my duty if I don't express my uh, sincere gratitude to the people who came forward uh, almost at the uh, within calling 24 hours, 48 hours, and they all of them came up with their guidelines. It did take us about two weeks to collate everything. And uh, we have the governing council, uh, Dr. Lalit is here, Namrata would be here, Dr. Nayak, Partha, I'm everybody. There. Yeah. I am there, sir. You're going to have a very long life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want a long life, I want a good one. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you. Uh, so we had the governing council, uh, uh, all of them came forward uh, at, uh, and IGO also published guidelines. So we did have guidelines right at the beginning when the lockdown happened, uh, wherein we, as per the advice of the prime minister, we said that uh, we should only be doing emergency services and emergency OT and OPD and procedures. So we had all these societies, Iskras, you had uh, UVR Society, Vitrio Retta, Pediatric Vision 2020, iBank, IARSI, so all these societies, neuro-ophthalmology, squint, all of them came forward uh, and we have been able to put uh, this uh, uh, book together. Now, what is important is that the number of cases are still rising in India, though statistically they are talking about doubling uh, the number of days it is taking to double. So that obviously has gone up, but the actual absolute numbers that are there are rising and there are a lot of experts who are saying that the maximum of number of cases that India is going to see is going to be in June and July. So one really doesn't know what the future holds for us. Majority of the countries have gone through a second, third and maybe a fourth phase. Uh, so by the time you develop herd immunity, we don't know where we will be and what we will be. So this is uh, two days old. Uh, now we are near to the 84,000 mark. You can see that the number of confirmed cases is going up pretty steeply. And we are, uh, uh, this curve or 84,000 is where China was. And then China absolutely flattened after that and came down. So one doesn't know as to where it is. Uh, and uh, uh, Kerala for one uh, was uh, among the number of cases being high, but then they have been able to do a brilliant job. I think we have seen the tweets of the umbrellas uh, where this uh, physical distancing has been uh, maintained with uh, the umbrellas, etc. But the trouble areas are Maharashtra, uh, you're looking at Delhi, you are looking at uh, Gujarat, you are looking at Tamil Nadu. So these are one, two, three, four, the highest. And then you have Rajasthan, you have Uttar Pradesh, you have Madhya Pradesh. And uh, by far the east is, uh, rel there's obviously some confusion about, uh, about West Bengal, but uh, the east has been relatively spared. But now you are having these uh, uh, cases come out of uh, uh, Odisha also with the migrant labor coming in. Now, uh, it was a timely and a tough decision that was taken by the Indian government uh, to have a lockdown, which was pretty solid. Uh, and uh, the unfortunately, the problem was that there are a lot of people who are stuck at places, migrant laborers wanting to go back, etc. Uh, uh, people being outside of India wanting to come back and within interstate tra uh, travel, etc. But obviously, it did achieve... Uh, the goals of uh, preparing the healthcare infrastructure, you, India got a couple of weeks to prepare the infrastructure for whatever infrastructure we have. We really don't know as to when the peak comes and what infrastructure would still be required. Like Bombay is in a poor shape and they are recruiting uh, all kinds of doctors now to do and all kinds of hospitals would only be doing COVID cases is something that came in new uh, yesterday. Uh, the population has been sensitized and uh, as things stand today, the mortality rate in India is pretty low and hope that it uh, remains. 
now the question obviously that is coming is life versus uh, livelihood and uh, i think the government uh, uh, there is a big debate in uh, all over the world i would say there are trump who is saying and uh, the uh, the uh, medical people saying that you should have a lockdown trump saying no and similarly in india also there is a debate of uh, livelihood as to how one would want to do so i think uh, back to business is one thing which is important and the government has possibly taken a decision to allow state wise things uh, to happen so let us uh, see as to what it is aims directors and other people have said that we should be thinking of living with the uh, covid somia somianathan who is from india who is the chief uh, scientist at who happened to be our class fellow too uh she has said that uh, uh, this is going to be there for 5 years so i really don't know where we are what we are going to have but till such time that there is a treatment and till such time that uh, there is a vaccine i think there is something that's going to be uh, we have to live with it now the important thing in the opd is that whenever a patient is coming you have to take uh, certain steps and one of the important steps is the declaration and consent that means that you have to take the history yesterday we were in a webinar and uh, john chang from hong kong said that they asked the history the same history three times to the patient about fever cough etc along with taking the thermal temperature and that is something which is the most important that is there uh, as to what uh, one has to do now the important thing in ophthalmology facility this is the government of india guideline that uh, came from the ministry of health which was uh, on 8th of may so what they have said is that the only places where you are not supposed to be functioning is in containment areas in the red zone otherwise whether it is red orange or green you are supposed to be uh, coming back to normal that means you are supposed to carry out all op ip procedures and clinical activities uh, what is important is that they have said that all precautions sterilization and disinfection has to happen Uh, social distancing uh, earlier they wrote six feet, but uh, then we told them that six feet is not the norm, so they had it reduced to one meter. Uh, documents minimum should be brought, paper documents, and uh, they should not idly be touched. They have talked about the uh, uh, cornea retrieval program, and they have said that it can be, it can continue for non-COVID donors, and there should be no home retrievals of the eyeballs just now. They are preferring a corneal rim uh, uh, button removal. and there are these sops that they have said and obviously we have come out in much more detail as aios to get these uh, sops that is there now the patient should be given proper protection as also uh, the staff uh, the healthcare workers everyone should be given uh, 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 the protection and what they have said and what we have also said is that normally you should uh, tell people not to come with attendants only attendants should be allowed if there is somebody is old infirm vulnerable or insane and as of now the camps need to be still uh, discontinued for at least two months more that's the guideline that the government has given because that is where uh, you will have congregation of people mobile services etc so that uh, still is on hold for two months uh, pre surgical covid test this is a question that is often asked for everybody it is not mandatory to get a pre surgical covid test if you want to have a high risk patient or intermediate risk patient then possibly you can get it done or if you are doing general anesthesia then you could get it done i think dr lalit will talk more about the anesthesia and uh, i posted in certain groups also mci had earlier given guidelines but now the gazette notification came out on 14th of may by the government allowing tele medicine or tele consultation as being a legal thing so it is now been notified in the gazette of india on 14th of may so there is a stress that we should look at all options where we are able to reduce the number of patient visits that are there now when you are going to opd or when the healthcare worker is going to work what is important for them is to carry minimum number of personal belongings uh, like laptops bags lunch boxes water bottle etc and since frequent hand washes would be required it is advisable not to be putting on watches and jewelry uh, you should carry a second piece of personal clothing with you bring the uniform in a washable bag those who do not have the uniform bring a set of personal clothing or extra shirt and you should change into them and the uh, clothes that you have worn at the hospital should immediately be put for a wash as soon as you reach home better to have a bucket with soap and water outside and take a warm water bath when you reach home 
uh, mask should be worn by you all the time whenever you leave the home until you come back uh, you can uh, have uh, the mask also discarded or uh, used so a normal trip a three ply triple uh, a triple ply mask is uh, something which is uh, done now what is very important is that all of you have these shields i hope the breath shields that have been done uh, there are various companies that are supplying it. Zeiss as a goodwill gesture is supplying it. Mera Itech is supplying it for Topcon uh, slit times, etc. But it is very easy to make and you should have, and it's very easy to uh, disinfect with uh, alcohol or uh, hypochlorite. Now, uh, upon reaching the hospital, what is important? Hand washing and hand sanitization is something very, very important. So you should have something outside your uh, outside your facility where a person can wash and then sanitize the hand, etc. Uh, all staff have also to be screened for thermal screening and have to give a history every day that they come regarding fever, sore throat, etc., etc. So it is not just for the patient, but it is also for the staff that is there. And you should try to uh, sanitize all phone, ID, spectacles, etc. once you enter the hospital as also once you leave. <clears throat> now, this is also very, very important that uh, fortunately in ophthalmology, there is not a significant privacy that you want for the patients. Uh, it is not gynae or whatever it is. So it's better to keep the doors open so that you don't have to open the doors again and again. So that uh, is one point that will reduce the touch and the possibility of transmission. Now, PPE is something which is a loose term. That means personal protection. So personal protection equipment can vary from stages to stages as to who has to wear what and not. So I, I think you have to uh, go for the AIOS guideline, but I'll tell you the basic things that has to be done. Now, you have to practice physical distancing at all the things in the OPD at the reception. You can play as a chair or whatever so that there is a distance that is maintained between the person who is at the reception. As also at the screening triage counter that you have, there should be a significant distance that is there. And the person who is at the tri triage counter at the screening needs to have good PPE. Namaste is the thing that you have to do. No handshaking, etc. Avoid touching your face and politely remind the others that uh, if you touch the outside of the mask, that's something which is a problem that you can have. And hand hygiene is something that is required. Now, these are the type of PPEs that you have. Uh, this is not really required where you have the entire hood cover, etc. Uh, in the OPD or even in the OT. In the OT, if there is an intermediate risk, the GA person can wear this, but not really an ophthalmologist is not required to wear this. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, 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 protection of the eye or a visor, these two things are required. Uh, we come in this category three, which is dentist. ENT and ophthalmologist because we come really near near to the patient. So these uh, these two things are essential. Uh, the mask can be an N95 mask uh, or you can even use a triple ply mask and gloves of some form, whether it is nitrile or the normal glove that should be required. Shoe cover is something which uh, in the OT you could have because of fluid coming down, but normally in the OPD this may not be required. So this is uh, the uh, list. There is a lot of list that is there in the AIOS guideline, uh, guidelines, pharmacists, optician, front office, etc. Everything is given. You can take that. Now, one important thing is that uh, the N95 and the three ply normally give almost a similar kind of a protection. So it is easy to dispose of the uh, three ply mask. So you can uh, dispose it of uh, once you come in and OT, you have to use a separate three ply and you should not be carrying the same that you're going from the OPD. But N95 mask, because of the cost that is involved, uh, the AIMS has issued guidelines that you can offer a person four sets. So if a person is coming every day on duty, you could break yourself into two shifts or three shifts uh, so that uh, because there is going to be a quarantine, if you get a patient uh, COVID positive in your OPD for seven days, those people who have come in touch with that patient would be quarantined. The facility will not be closed. But the people who come in touch will be put up for seven days quarantine. So ideally, you should break up your manpower into two or three shifts so they can come on alternate day or whatever way you want so that not all of them are put under quarantine if you have some patient who's or some healthcare worker who turns out to be positive. Now, N95 masks, what they say is that it can be used for one plus four times that means five times the uh, average wearing hours being about eight nine hours so 45 so 72 hours uh, up to 72 hours they say an n95 mask can be used so one day you use it 
then you put it in a plastic uh, uh, you put it in a uh, uh, cover take it and keep it for aeration and heat it so a lot of people have asked plasma sterilization if you have that can be done uh, eto should not be done because that has toxic residue so that is something that you can do but 72 hours and then you can again get back the cycle of wearing it again so aerate put it off uh, exposed to uh, so some place where there is heat etc and then you could use it so an n95 mask as per aims guidelines can be used one plus four times that is there and uh, you need to dispose it in a yellow bin now the other equipment which is mandatory for you and the optician would be uh, sorry the optometrist would be either these glasses or the face shield or you if you want you can do both so this is how you need to put and that uh, you should personalize each and do not uh, remix uh, mix that now after work when you go back uh, you should remove the ppe disinfect protective glasses and failed sheet or dispose as you may in the yellow and the gloves in the red uh, uh, those uh, plastic disposable bags uh, now change back into home clothes sanitize again the phone id leave uh, what you can at the workplace whatever items are needed daily at the workplace and needed to get home so you do, shouldn't have a lot of transmission Keep washing your hands. Alcohol uh, is something which prices are short up, but now a lot of Indian companies are making. So a five liter can you can get at below 1000 rupees now. So that is something that you need to have. Uh, ideally, you should ring up home. This is Ministry of Home Affairs uh, guidelines. You should ring up home so that somebody keeps the door open for you. And there should be a bucket or something by which you can have soap and water and wash your hands and put your dirty clothes into that uh, bucket so that uh, they can be washed and you don't carry them inside home and go home uh, take a bath including a head bath immediately after arriving and wash your work clothes along with the bag and practice wellness activities every day it is important that you keep your mind active and you have uh, your, your morale high that is there now what is very very important both for the staff as also the patient is that you need to have the arogya setu downloaded uh, it is kind of almost semi-mandatory or maybe mandatory for us. Uh, we can disallow a patient from uh, uh, coming in if the Arogya Setu is not there and the location, uh, it has to be location enabled. Otherwise, it doesn't help if the Arogya Setu is on or not. The patient information and modified OPD flow checklist for the patient education should be there near the entrance. The patient should be guided. Ideally, we are at center for science sending an SMS to the patient that you should carry your own hand sanitizer. Uh, if they don't have a and wear a mask when you come, if they don't have a mask, we are providing them. Uh, we, we can provide them mask at the desk or the trial that is there and that should always be kept at the screening area. This is there. Avoid cash transaction, avoid paper and cardboard folders. If you have to have paper, then it should ideally be put in a plastic folder. And the plastic folder can be sanitized with the alcohol or even hypochlorite that is there. Uh, there are these protocols that uh, have been given in the AIOS and you can refer to them, which is for the screening desk, for the OPD, dilatation, refraction, optical shop. Ideally, what has been mentioned is that every two to three hours, there should be disinfection of the floor, the doorknobs, etc. And the most common that is going to be used is the hypochlorite solution. Now, protocol for uh, uh, surgery and IPD will be uh, given by Dr. Lalit, but what is important is that it is only a 20 minute gap that you want between two GA procedures under local you can just clean the uh, floor and mop because we are dealing with non COVID patients, please in case there is any any doubt about a patient having symptoms of COVID do not let the patient come in and the patient should be referred to a COVID identified facility where they should go uh, disinfection. Uh, uh, patient clean the area again this is very very extensive that has been given whether it is the auto ref yag retina etc nct as things stand is something that uh, uh, may be aerosol generating so we don't uh, uh, quite uh, say that that should be done a goldman and uh, then sterilization or an ik tonometer that is something that is there uh, papers on the chin rest uh, may or may not be used but ideally the chin rest has to be always clean with alcohol between each patients barrier of skin uh, screen has to be there probes a scan b scan ubm uh, pachymeter etc uh, they can be easily cleaned with 70 percent isopropyl alcohol and uh, the housekeeping uh, has to be divided according to the low risk moderate risk and high risk uh, we would normally be catering to the low risk or the moderate and they need to be cleaned every two to three hours 
uh, suspected or confirmed COVID positive patient or employee, you have to definitely inform the local health authorities, disinfect the entire facility and refer the patient to the designated COVID facility and contact tracing and quarantine has to be done. Uh, ICMR recommended the hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis and that still stays that you should give hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, prophylaxis. So that's all that I'll wish to say. The guidelines are very, very extensive, but uh, you can read through them and whatever our questions are there, we'll be happy to answer. But all that I'll say once again is let us keep our morale high and uh, we there is going to be light at the uh, end of the dark tunnel. And all that I'll say is that when it rains, look for the rainbows, but when it is dark, try to look for the stars. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, sir, for a very informative talk. And uh, you have talked right from epidemiology to government strategies to our strategies. Thank you very much. Uh, over to Dr. Lalit Verma. Now we will just move on to the theater. Uh, can you share your screen, please, sir? Yeah, yeah I will. I will. Yeah. So uh, in the theater, uh, what are the strategies that we have to adopt so that uh, you know, person to person and person to surgeon transmission of COVID does not take place. We'll finish all the talks and then rapidly go into the questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have received we'll about minutes. 25 questions already. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you, Gopal, uh, uh, Sai, Shashi, and everybody involved. You see, even at the cost of uh, repetition multiple times, uh, this uh, webinar assumes importance to solve a lot of queries. Because believe me, for ophthalmologists, if they don't do OT operations, what will they do? You see, as Mahipal rightly said, it's life versus uh, uh, livelihood. And uh, you see, courtesy Government of India, we have been able to contain it uh, or flatten the curve. And there is no spurt of cases at one go, although peak may still occur in, uh, in uh, a later part of uh, June or so. But believe me, that does not mean that, uh, you see, we should not start our operation theater. Believe me, at Center for Sight, we haven't closed the theater uh, at all. We do, we have been doing uh, emergency surgeries of detachments, end off and injections, and since uh, for the last 52 days also. But I think uh, uh, we have uh, now instruction that from the next week, most likely, the routine cases will also start. Uh, Thank all these people for uh, having me here and mentored also for uh, this arranging this webinar. And as uh, was being told, a uh, lot of people, more than 220 experts have uh, joined hands to produce this 101 page uh, document. And this was the vision of uh, our president, Mipal of AIUS, that he wanted this at any cost and he was after our lives to, that this has to come uh, uh, this week. And he was the true visionary and the dedication and commitment shown by Honorary Secretary and Honorary Treasurer was exemplary and they worked overnight also to produce this document along with the AIS staff. And three cheers to all these people. I will also read these names uh, who have been very, very, uh, uh, very, very uh, hardworking to bring out this document. You see, believe me, the, guide, the aim of all the guidelines, but these guidelines are broad based. They can't take each and every specific temperatures and humidity into it. And also we have to remember, we are making these guidelines for all ophthalmologists. That is all 20, 30,000 ophthalmologists which we have in this country. So therefore, they ought to be very simple. We cannot cannot put AHU everywhere. We cannot cannot put uh, negative uh, uh, you know, pressure ventilation everywhere. So with this in mind, we this guidelines uh, was framed. Because aim is that we have to help all the ophthalmologists start their work. But if we make them too complicated, believe me, a lot of our members, more than 80-90% will not be able to start and then legal issues may be here. And in fact, Government of India has never said no that ophthalmologists should not be starting their uh, practices. The other thing which I think Vipal also said was that these are dynamic. You see, there was a time when masks were, masks were not allowed or not considered uh, mandatory. Now the masks are, are a part of the uh, uh, PPE equipment. You see, we have to view that, firstly, the routine operation theater, aseptic procedures, what all of us have been doing, they have to be done. But now, now that we are recommissioning our uh, operation theaters, so we have to focus what we need to do now. So 
overhaul the entire cleaning of the OT zones as per protocol. Also, it is mandatory that uh, since you are starting after a long, long time, do uh, you know adhere to this policy of uh, cultures? Have a culture negative report before you start because it has been closed and not ventilated for a very long time. Staff, uh, uh, as this has been emphasized in the OPD uh, lecture also, but consent of your own staff is very, very important. You have to uh, do their thermal scanning. You have to take their consent also and history also to be done for each. And this has to be done virtually every day. And regarding this physical parameters for a PNSCSIA and housekeeping staff, I think these uh, four or five things are good enough. A cap, three ply mask does serve the purpose. There's no need to go mad for N95 and metal gloves. Protective glasses where aerosol generation is high, I think this does uh, make a difference. And linen OT attire is good enough. Same is true for CSSD areas, but cap, mask, and uh, gloves and protective face shield. Uh, very, very cheap protective face shields are available, which can be used. Then OT staff and surgeon attire, I think, uh, again, and then there is not a must, although uh, the director of AIMS says, uh, does, uh, did say this, that you can use uh, one plus four as was being told. Any sterile gloves should do. Protective glasses, if you are doing, uh, you see, a, because I also tried uh, microscopy surgery through this, it's very cumbersome, so I gave it up. Only for, you know, non microscopy surgery, you could push a face shield. But for a vitectomy and other microscope surgery, it is not a must. The other thing is normal footwear, or you can have a foot uh, covers with you. But be very careful about spillage of uh, fluids and uh, from the from the uh, surgical area. Patient flow. This is this this is uh, very important because this we are not used to. We uh, you know uh, normally don't take care in our routine uh, procedures. So physical distancing, even in the OT, you see, should not call too many. Even if there's small procedure like injections, don't call them together in the OT. So one patient is in the operation theater, one is in the waiting room, one is uh, in the OPD area. So one by one. So although time taken may be more, but all these precautions should be taken. Then within the operation theater, try to have minimal possible staff. So you can ask all the reserve staff either not to come or come uh, on specified days. So minimal possible staff, what is required on that particular day, like surgeon, OT nurse, anesthetist, and running nurse. I think they are good enough for you to take care, plus one or two for emergency purposes. Segregate biomedical waste at the source itself. You all know this color-coded covers. And ensure safe and sterile consumables. You see, this is important for countries like India, where a lot of people ask whether I need to open a separate pack or this thing. I don't think so uh, that is required. But as, as long as you can assure sterility of uh, these consumables, maybe you can re-ETO and use it. Surface cleaning of equipment and OT table and floor in between cases. GA cases, it, it's required, you know, because it's a more aerosolization uh, generating procedure. So you have uh, to uh, clean up, clean that up. For local cases, topical cases, I think a routine uh, disinfection, uh, mopping of the floor is good enough. Then for uh, AHU ventilation, there has been a lot of confusion actually. Initially, a lot of people uh, you know, made us believe that negative uh, pressure OTs are a must, but believe me, they are no longer required. They, they, there's no 100% uh, uh, this thing that they are a must. Only in the COVID uh, caring units, where COVID hospitals, they may be required, but not for ophthalmology. Because in any case, we are triaging uh, our patients at OPD and OT every level. So very low risk that uh, you may be you know, having a COVID positive patient. Although asymptomatic carriers are the biggest threat, but, uh, but believe me, we can't invest so much into negative pressure uh, uh, OTs. So only thing which you, a, routine AH you can run, but ensure more exchanges, more air exchanges, more than say 30, 35 exchanges to take place. And also have temperature humidity to be appropriate. Temperature should be slightly higher than what we are used to. We normally keep 18 to 20, but you can have 24 degree for, for the OT temperature. And for those of you having split air conditioning, I think it's good enough. Room uh, uh, window AC is one thing which is uh, not uh, uh, allowed, but split air conditioner I think can be, can be used. With the, again, uh, provision of uh, temperature and humidity, 
and also try to recirculate air uh, within a single occupied vehicle. And other other important precaution is to clean these filters more often than what you have been doing in the in the past. Then for GA cases, this again uh, we have to learn to live with this COVID era. This COVID is not going to die down. We have to start practicing. The surgical team will not enter till the time NSCs, NSCs have done their job. Only after they give a green signal that everything is ready, then you enter. And anesthetists obviously will have, apart from this mask and gloves, they have to have this face shield because, because during GA, uh, I think more PPP is required than, than during uh, topical and, and local anesthesia. And after the case is finished, surgical team waits outside till the time anesthetist extubates and brings the patient out. And only after the patient shifted out, then uh, he can be gone. Biomedical waste, I've already said, use separate colored, uh, covers, which we already do. But important is, biomedical waste should leave the hospital as early as possible within 48 hours, so that this does not become another source. Although fomite is not the you know main thing, but you see, virus is known to uh, adhere to these fomites for uh, a, a day or two. Therefore, there, that is the reason uh, we have to be very, very careful about this. Instrument cleaning, uh, uh, before you pack them, I think all of us do routinely, but they have to be handled very, very safely by the cleaning staff. Patient attire is as per protocol because patients should not enter the operation theater in the street clothes. Even though it may be a small internal injection, they have to you know, change these clothes. Medical search for doctors also, therefore it's relevant for patients also. And all patients should wear at least three ply masks before they enter because and other thing is talking within the OT has to be minimized because talking, normal talking, as I'm talking now, also generates aerosols. So that also has to be minimized. Patient draping, uh, all of you do wonderfully well. Draping of the patient should be done with an adhesive eye drape. The drape should firmly stick around. The reason of more firm stick around is that we don't want this drained fluid or water to spill because this may, this may be an issue. So this is what I thought. Don't be too much scared about it. It's a respiratory virus and mask sanitization and safe distancing are the key things. PPE and, and uh, split air condition can be used and it's not a must to have a AHU in all this. And in case you have, you need to consult your engineers for, for uh, this. Thank you very much uh, for patient listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Dalit. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have finished the OPD as well as the OT strategy. Meanwhile, I would like to introduce to all of you Dr. Narmata, Narmata Sharma, our honorary uh, secretary of the All India Ophthalmic Society, who joined a little late. She was in another webinar. Uh, Madam is the professor at the uh, RP Center, uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the largest government institution in the country. And she will also be addressing to us about the government, uh, the, the problems in the government sector as well. So now over to RDR, sir. Uh, Dr. RDR will be speaking on uh, Arvind's strategies, a brief presentation on how Arvind is uh, looking at uh, how to manage this particular epidemic. Over to RDR, sir. Dr. RDR, R.D. Ravindran, sir. Yeah. But I think you have muted yourself, sir. Can you see the slides yeah, now? Yeah, we can see and hear you, sir. Okay, okay. I mean, uh, so, so good evening, everybody. At, at the outset, would like to thank uh, the organizers, especially Dr. Gopal Pillai, Sai Kumar, Sashi Kumar, everybody. I mean, we heard a lot uh, from Dr. Mahipal and also from Lalit. Uh, at this point, I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Mahipal, Namrata, and all the other people who brought out a very excellent uh, guidelines from AOS. I mean, it's very important to read through that. And what is important is, you know, it, it is full of solutions. I mean, uh, I mean, what we need to do. But if we can understand the principles that have gone behind putting those uh, solutions or the pra protocols, it's very important. I mean, uh, during this era, I mean, what is very important is we have to ensure personal safety with the ophthalmologists and also the co-staff who are working along with you. 
their safety is also important. So a lot of protocols that are in place is addressing towards that. The second part is, I mean, there is a, we have to really rebuild the patient's trust. The patient, the public, common public read so much about the corona and they have a fear of coming into the hospital because also they hear about so many of the doctors, nurses getting this. So, I mean, whatever we do within our organization, within our own practice, we should be able to rebuild that trust from the patient so that, you know, they have the confidence and come over to the hospital for taking the treatment. The third important is, I mean, it's also important, whether it's an organization or a private practice, how do you make sure that the, your practice or your organization sustains? I think whatever all the protocols will probably will be addressing these things. I'll just go over one by one. One is about the ensuring personal safety. I mean, one uh, principle, I mean, whatever I put, I put about eight or nine under this ensuring personal uh, staff safety, but I don't think the list is complete. So when we talk about appropriate PPE, because we have to really understand how the risk stratification is done, low, medium, or uh, high, based on that, we need to give the PPE. The staff should understand how to wear it, how to remove it, how to decontaminate it. How often no, they can use it? Dr. Maipal talked about you know, four or five times surgical ply every day. If you're using a, I mean, what kind of a thing you have to give it for office staff, all that is, is to be, uh, I mean, we have to understand and put all that under this. The second is we really need to make sure that you know, any COVID patient or suspected patient will not get into the OPD or IPD. That is where all the contact history, history of fever, thermal screening, all that becomes important. All that has to come under this. The third is how do we minimize the contact with the patient? This is where now, how do we make sure that our staff will always maintain that three to four feet uh, distance from the patient? And uh, any verbal communication should happen only if the patient is three feet away. And how do we make sure that we don't touch the belongings of the patient? If we have to touch it, is there a way where, where the patient can re clean it, sterilize it, or no, uh, disinfect it and give it to us. I mean, all that we have to understand. Whatever we do is also to minimize that contact. The, the other point is, how do we minimize the contact with the patient while testing? I mean, there are protocols where we talk about, you know, when we have to really uh, do certain things, how we can ask the patient to open their eyes, how we can use a cotton bud to open the eye. I mean, as, as far as possible, how do we minimize the contact? There are also people talk about, you know, having a, a, a kind of a, a segregation, a plastic sheet when you do some of the investigations, all that. So all that, you know, we have to think under this. And then if we can think about it, how do we minimize it, then we can come up with some protocols. And we also talk about how do we minimize the eye testing? How do we minimize, do only when it is necessary intraocular pressure or testing the duct. And even when we use it, to use the appropriate methodology, like you know, gonioscopy or all that, we have to make sure that you know, we minimize it. And again, how do we minimize the contamination of the hospital environment by the patient? This is where the patient's wearing the mask, the patient's you know, bringing very minimal uh, personal belongings. All that lot of things also, Dr. Mahipal talked about it. I think all that becomes important. I mean, equally important is also the staff obligations. A lot was said by Dr. Mahipal on that. I mean, including the, how, how do we they minimize the personal belongings which they bring into the hospital, the jewelry, all that. And similarly, they also have an obligation when they go back home. That is also equally important. That was also brought out by Dr. Mahipal very well. And again, we also make sure that we follow all the disinfection procedures. It's mainly because that is going to save the person because we are going to spend most of the time, even the patients will come and go. All the disinfection procedures we have to understand and then we have to use them in a, in a very scientific way. And we also have talked about, especially in the operating room, AHU, where we have split AC, we, is it possible to do certain kind of a infrastructure changes so that, you know, it's our safety and our co-worker safety is also ensured. So I put together like about nine principles, but probably if you go through the 
the guidelines, probably you, you'll be able to uh, bring up many more things which may not fit into this, then probably you have to create, put them under some, some other heading. The other equally important you know, how to, to is also make sure that how do we rebuild the patient's trust. I mean, one of the important thing is as the patients come into the hospital, we have to really make them understand about the protocols and processes for a better cooperation because we are going to ask the patients for so many of those new consent forms, all that, you know, they should not really think that you know, this, is, this is the place they may get an infection. I mean, even though it's good to have the consent form, but people have to really understand that part of it. And again, the patients may not be very comfortable with seeing too many people in the hospital. So how do we really minimize the people in the hospital? Like within Aravind, we are going to a you know, kind of an appointment system or a scheduling system, understanding our capacity, the capacity of the doctors there, the number of people. We are trying to minimize the number of people so that you know, we make sure that the patients leave the hospital within like 60 minutes or 90 minutes. And they, again, making sure that you ensure social distancing. You have talked about you know, chairs and alternate uh, sitting and then where exactly they are located, all that becomes very, very important. And then again, the periodical decontamination of the equipments and surfaces in the clinical area, I think we need to really do it in the presence of the patient. If you are able to do that, that again will build the confidence of the patients in, the, in our system. And again, this is also a challenging time making, you know, remaining transparent, you know, we may have to charge them extra for the PPE or many other things. I mean, how do we make all that very transparent, but still keep it affordable and accessible to the patient? So, you know, here, a lot of things, the change of practice may make it inaccessible for the patient. We have to be really sensitive and make sure that people can access our services. The last part is about how do we ensure our practice sustainability? The very first uh, the webinar we had with the AOS, Dr. Mayipal talked a lot about uh, the staff interaction, the policies regarding compensation, salary, retrenchment, all that is, we, we have talked about it. I think they're all important. I think we need to have that interaction with the, with the staff, which is very important. And uh, retaining the staff and the patients is what we talked about. I think doing those, the following those principles of ensuring the safety of the staff and building the trust of the patients will be able to retain them. And again, the patient flow management is very important. Some of that, you know, you may have to figure out how it has to be done within your hospital. The main idea is that, you know, how do we reduce the overall time spent in the hospital by the patient? You may have to delegate some of the activities, you know, you are doing to a, an optometrist or a junior doctor, which will help us to reduce the overall time spent in the hospital for each patient. And again, how do you minimize the follow-up visits? Here, you know, either doing a telemedicine, either a telephonic consultation or a video consultation for the follow-up visits. Now, if you look at, uh, for example, last year, we had seen about 5 million outpatient visits, about 50 lakh visits, but we did about 5 lakh surgeries. And that 5 lakh surgeries or the procedures are what is going to bring the revenue for the hospital. I mean, each of those uh, procedures probably will need a pre-op visit, a procedure visit, and a post-op visit. So it's about about 15 lakh, 1.5 million visits are the important visits. The rest of the visits is, is mostly some kind of a follow-up and all that. Or maybe a patients who will not really need that kind of, uh, a real serious uh, uh, intervention. How do we minimize those follow-up visits is also very important. And how do you also minimize the referrals? I mean, if you, if you have especially... There are hospitals where there are multiple doctors. You refer between the doctors one from one department to another. How do we create internal guidelines so that we can minimize the referrals at this point of time? And then any, even a private practitioner, if they can facilitate telemedicine a consultation with their colleagues, all that you know, will help the patient and uh, build the confidence of the patient in you. So instead of sending them like 200, 300 kilometers away, if you can facilitate that part, it also will be very helpful. And having a kind of a monitoring team to oversee the PP usage, decontamination procedures, documentation, because you now we have this wonderful doc documentation of guidelines from the 
AOS and many other places. But you know, if you are not going to use it in a proper way, it, it may not be meaningful. Again, a team to implement all that is very important. And whatever said and done, we are going to face you no know, COVID patients coming into our system. Our staff getting maybe a, a, an infection. How we are going to you know? We know when there's a cluster infection happens, how we manage it. Similarly, we have to think about how we are going to have a crisis management team within the hospital, so that you know we know if something has happened, how we are going to proceed. All that becomes important. Like AIO is an earlier had put together a team for like end of the month. Is you know each state you can call somebody. I think something similar if we can do at state wise, even the every society knows you know if something like this happens, you know these are the people have to be contacted. And there is an external support. Similarly, internal team is also very important. I mean, we have to make this transition. I think the the very first sentence by our president is that it's going to be new normal, the ophthalmic practice. I think we have to make that transition. That will not happen unless the senior staff in the organizations are involved. So I think, uh, I mean, like uh, within Aravind, we have uh, created multiple teams, about eight to ten teams. So that each one taking care of each area. I mean, awareness creation is very important. As I said earlier, having the guideline is alone is not going to be helpful. And understanding all these changed principles, you know, of practice management, it's very very important. And again, having some kind of checklist like what we have for surgery. Even here, if we have a checklist, then the complaints also will be complete. I think I mean this is kind of a idea. This just wanted to share with all of you. Thanks, sir, doctor. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very yeah. much for a for a center which is looking at uh, uh, 50 lakhs people and operating 5 lakhs people. COVID uh, presents itself a rare opportunity to make yourself a little more uh, appointment based and structured. So, coming to the uh, last talk, uh, Dr. Kaushik Murli, who is the president of the Shankara uh, Society, uh, he will be speaking to us on. Um, the Shankara experience for COVID, and I hope uh, it will be a good talk. Thank you, Dr. Rupert. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is uh, sharing some of the innovations that we have done at Shankara as a part of getting ready for the post COVID 19 scenario. Uh, so, what COVID has taught us is the need that. Uh, we need to first of all accept that we don't know it all. It's an evolving dynamic thing like Dr. Mahipal mentioned. And it requires us to change behavior because not only is it a new normal, but also the entire world is watching as to how we react to it. The third thing it has done is it has created an environment of collaboration. I don't think we've ever had a situation where SOPs of large institutions have really been shared ever before. So there is some silver lining out of this entire crisis. And it is also key for us to be able to communicate. We need to communicate internally to our team about the changes. We need to communicate to our patients about the changes that we have brought about so that they are also much more confident about what we have done. All of this needs to be done, but not necessarily at a very high cost. What we have done is we've looked to keep it very simple. So when you look at disinfectants, you have a whole variety of disinfectants available. We have looked at using the simple Lysol because this is something the entire housekeeping team is familiar with. And just you need one cap full and four liters for pretty much every area of the hospital. This has been shown to be effective against the SARS-CoV. So it works very well in our situation also. So avoid your inventory, keep it very, very simple. So when you're disinfecting, have clear norms as to what you're going to use in each area. So 1% hypochlorite, Lysol, 70% alcohol is more than enough to clean almost every surface. When you're using the sterilium or similar hydrants, you need to be a little careful because they have certain emoluments to make it skin friendly. This can leave residues on the optics of our system. So it is always better to pick up 100% alcohol and dilute it down and use it. The second thing that we've done is uh, we realized that people wanted to use a no touch kind of a dispenser. So our biomedical team came up with a very simple contraption. What they did is they picked up a large PVC tube, drilled a hole into it, used the standard dispenser that you have for your uh, sterilizers, picked up a tube that was lying in the this L-clamp from a fire extinguisher stand, and kind of threaded through it. 
So once you have this, you have something where you can just put your foot through and hold it through. So again, you don't need to invest in very expensive equipment. This can be kept across the hospital and becomes very, very useful. With all the disinfection, our equipment stand a risk of getting degraded. So we again looked at a simple solution where we use a clean glass. Uh, this is again a regular kitchen clean grab that we've taken. This clean grab is used because whenever you do procedures like a laser or an OCT, the patient comes very close to the optics. So use the clean grab, make sure there is no bubbles or coats on it. The OCT is really, really good. You can again use 70% alcohol and wipe it off between patients. The same thing can be done for your YAG laser as well as for the Pascal laser. It's just that the laser spots are slightly smaller, but clinically we have not found any difference. Uh, in the OT, again, we had a concern about the expired air coming out of the voice separators. So rather than investing in very expensive PPEs, uh, we came up with a simple solution where we used the vein circuit that is available with the reducers and attached it to the suction apparatus. The suction machine is turned off. We just filled it with 1% hypochlorite. It goes to the second chamber. And then there is an outlet that goes to the return air duct in the AC line. So this minimizes the ambient aerosols that are there in the air. And it gives that much more confidence to our entire team about what we are doing. And that kind of helps us in a very big way. So that's what I just wanted to share, saying that don't get too bogged down or worried about COVID. You will come up with very simple solutions. And it is, it is not rocket science to actually solve it. Thank you very much, Kaushik, for this crisp talk on innovations. So that will bring us closer to finding solutions to a lot of uh, problems that we have. Now, over to the more an anticipated part of this particular um, uh, webinar would be that, you know, Dr. Namrata and Dr. Mahipal and all the AIOS people have brought in this wonderful 100-page policy for AIOS. And there are definitely a lot of questions. Uh, based on that and and some repetitive questions which people may require a clarification in and dr sai and uh, dr shashi has actually made questions dr sai has made questions on the opd and dr shashi has made questions on the ot etiquette and i am receiving questions from the facebook live youtube live and the web link so now let's start the question for answer so it's it's, it's like our it's like our exam now, Gopal. Yeah. After writing, <laughs> after writing the book, now we have to answer <laughs> questions. Okay, madam. Uh, uh, I think first we'll go on to do some of the uh, you know clarifications from the guidelines uh, as far as the OPD is concerned. Now, one of the concerns that has been raised regarding the OPD is the use of the air conditioner in the o, in, in the OPD. Because there are some people who said that you should not use an air conditioner, keep the door open. If you have a window in the room, keep the window open. Don't use air conditioners at all. So, uh, uh, Madam uh, Dr. Namrata, can you just throw some light on what is, uh, what do you think is the current guidelines and what do you think is ideal situation for an OPD as far as the use of an air conditioner is concerned? Actually, unfortunately, it's also going to be the, uh, you know, hot season all over India, the summer season. And what is generally recommended is that all the windows, etc. should remain open for ventilation. And if you do need, if you do have uh, uh, air conditioners, which are, which is a central air conditioner, then uh, what was being recommended by our engineers uh, at AIMS was that you put UV filters into that. Having said that, they have not done it. And if you have a split AC, then the number of the air flows which are there in your, uh, this thing should increase. And if you have a window AC, then uh, you can't do anything about it. So that was the, uh, that was as far as the air conditioning was concerned. But I think we will put, have to put on the air conditioners given the fact that it's going to be very hot and we are also going to be wearing, you know, uh, the PPE and the mask so uh, I think we will have to put the air conditioners on. Uh, Dr. Maipal and Dr. Ladit can take a call on that too. Considering the considering the uh, temperature is in the summer season. So actually, uh, the ASHRAE has given out guidelines uh, that the refrigeration society, etc. What is very very important is that there have to be air exchanges. That is all that is required. Apart from that, uh, uh, the uh, there's one uh, report that came of the restaurant where people were sitting and directly under the uh, under the air conditioner they got infected in Wuhan. Uh, 
the main issue uh, what dr namrata was saying about the uv uv uh, is at the time of the ahu what they have said but that is only the spores or the bacteria etc on the coils that are there it only disinfects that but it does not do anything to the air that is coming in so the, there was a lot of this thing on the uv but ultimately it does not make any difference on to the air that is coming in uh, in the opd what is therefore required is that you can keep your air conditioners on but if you keep your doors open the positive pressure will wash it away and at best if you want you can also in addition put a fan so if your doors are open or if the main door is open or if there is a window that is open it will allow the exchange of the air so that the aerosol if at all there is anything that can be washed away so that is all that is required it is not that the ac should be off but you need to the disinfection that you are doing of the floors as has been pointed out whether you are using hypochlorite or uh, lysol etc that can be done and the surfaces uh, with alcohol or whatever you want so that is very very important and if you get frequent air changes that is all that is required and that is why now even a negative pressure ot is not something that is recommended because that needs structural changes a positive pressure ot with adequate air exchanges is something that is required so that is all that you have to do and uh, and at the end of the day you should in the ot also you do your air exchanges keep all the doors open and then you can remove it and then you can close it and do the fumigation thank you sir mohan sir uh, mohan uh, dr pi mohan sir can you just share your thoughts on the use of air conditioner sir please unmute yourself mohan sir audible na yeah yeah yes sir uh, in, in in the opd ideally as uh, uh, we were discussing i think uh, without ac would be better with doors open and additional fan you look at the air flow it should be from the door to the doctor to the patient and out but then if you are discussing about that uh, uh, air exchange uh, that also is possible but uh, dr namada was uh, telling about the uv uh, disinfection yes it is possible to me to my knowledge uh, uv lights can be fit, it should be fitted into the ac ducts at different points starting from the cooling to the end and uh, that uh, you should take into consideration the velocity of the air flow and the tons uh, how many tons of ac that you are using and uh, if i give you a calculation that i have collected is if the air velocity is 8200 cubic foot per minute and if you are using an 8.5 ton ac you need about uh, 14 tube lights of 36 watts each in clusters in three different places especially at the cooling from the cooling to the uh, end of it so three clusters so that is possible but i think um, ac uh, as I said i know i am also in north india now in ludhiana so oh, oh, i know what the okay. heat is like <laughs> no there is an audience question which is coming sir yeah gopal uh, there is an audience Pardon? question which is uh, very related to it which has come dr prashob mohan asks are uh, air purifiers which are commercially available helpful in the opd if you put one air purifier in each air purifier <laughs> yeah air purifiers are good like you know uh, but then how effective it will be what will be the size of the single room is if you remember uh, one of our earlier discussions with uh, i think uh, one industrial air purifier is available not unlike in north india when even my daughter's home they have air purifiers in in the uh, time where there is a pollution if the uh, uh, part, uh, this one goes up to 400 500 and all that but that i don't know that whether that is enough for this particular condition there is no evidence are you sure air, air air purifier will take uh, for 1 nanometer of this virus i don't think air purifier so there is a there is an industrial air purifier which is available yeah. that's what i think so not what, the normal uh, one that you buy of philips and all that hmm. apart from the size this whatever maypal initially said uh, you see uh, that's perfectly okay except i wanted to add one more element of less crowding so you have to keep the doors open yeah. if you don't put on the ac you will be uncomfortable 
So put on the AC, doors open, some more exhaust, more exchanges, and less crowding. You insist on this. Thank you. So basically, you, sir, can, yeah. What yeah. I just wish to say is that uh, there was another discussion in which an air conditioning expert or some air purifier is actually increased the circulation of the whole thing. So on the contrary, they said that the air purifier yes. is of use because of the main problem that uh, it is not going to filter the virus, but on the contrary, it will increase the circulation of the same aerosol within the room because the air is. Uh, I think what Doctor Doctor Mohan sir said. Uh, in the beginning, that you know, the airflow should be from the door to the doctor to the patient and the out. That also is a good, uh, good, uh, useful tip which uh, one can follow if it is possible in that clinic. Thank you, sir. Can we can we move on to the next point? Uh, the next point is the use Dr. of Dr. face shield. Ravindran has a point. Adya, sir, you want to say something? No, no, just just one point. Yeah, in, sorry. In the early days, when the whole thing started, we had an interaction with our Chinese uh, friends. Because they had all the experience. The three things they stressed was one, wash your hands often, don't touch your face. Third is ventilation. They said, no, keep your doors, windows open. Even if you have air conditioning, keep it open. I think still that's what we follow. We have the air conditioner on, but we try to keep the, the fresh air dampener open as much as possible and then keep all the windows open. And wherever we don't have windows, those areas we are not opening. We are not using it. We have kind of done an audit and we have closed all those rooms so that people will not use those rooms. So ventilation is key. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, can we go on to the next point, which is the use of face shields? Now, there are a lot of, you know, innovations and, you know, many uh, locally made uh, innovative face shields and all. Most of them are really a hindrance for slit lamp examination, for indirect ophthalmoscopy, so what would be a you know a real uh, recommended face shield or if you wear an n95 or a three ply mask and wear a goggle is it good enough uh, do you really need a face shield in every situation uh, what is your take on that uh, I think in that, in that yeah. guidance, Madam, we yeah. mentioned this was a this was a concern which was raised by the other members and we did mention that you could even either have goggles oblique even glasses that is what we put and face shield was also put there and visor, oblique visor was also put there. So the basic thing is that there should be some level of protection which, which should be there on your eyes also. So that was the whole idea. But yes, face shield I'm sure will go undergo, people will innovate and will come out with the options which will be more friendly uh, as we go, as we actually start our practice in our center, RT center, we have also already started uh, our ocular pharmacology department has already started making face shields which get stuck with a velcro you know velcro kind of a thing here so you just have to stuck it here and there are different ones for the one who's wearing glasses and different ones for the person who's not wearing glasses so they've made it a little more friendly but i'm sure everybody will you know find out some local ways of innovating uh, face shields you see, well, for, yeah. slit lamp, for slit lamp, I think a simple transparency with the two holes is good enough. For indirect, I think face shield is very cumbersome. So I depend on uh, people who wear glasses, it's okay. People who don't wear glasses, so they can have a protective glass and a, and a mask to cover. These two are good enough. Okay. Shashi, uh, yeah. Innovations are coming in. The first time we uh, bought the face shield was from Studs, uh, the people who made the helmets. Why, and sir? Yeah. Yeah, wise, the, just the visor part of the helmet and uh, that uh, was uh, 200 then they increased it to 250 plus GST etc. But now other companies have made it the problem is the transparency of it at times goes down and uh, therefore better quality ones have come and uh, we have also joined with the Akriti, uh, the people who made the prosthetic eye also. So they are coming out with these transparencies of the, uh, the covers for all instruments as also for the face. So people are innovating on that. It's not a very difficult thing, but the uh, the guideline from a government is very clear that dentist, ENT, and ophthalmology, in addition to the mask, need some cover, either those uh, goggles. Now these goggles in uh, Delhi are available for about 100 rupees, with the, which looks like the swimming uh, goggles that have scuba diving type goggles. Or you can have the face shield. So something is definitely required for ophthalmology because uh, you're... Uh, coming close to and yesterday or day before there was a 
joke on WhatsApp that uh, after Corona, the direct ophthalmoscope is dead. <laughs> Interestingly, so many companies who are who used to make other products have now started, you know, making PP and face shields and masks because they think that they can earn money here. So all the other companies which were there with us have started doing that. There are some questions from the audience based on this. One is split AC or you know ordinary AC with you know room doors open. I think the compressor is going to go for a six. Definitely yes. I would assume that. No, no, no. The, the problem with split AC is that there is no air exchange in split AC. Air exchange, at least fresh air intake is more in a window AC than a split AC. So what is the normal number of air exchange? And here, what is the number of air exchanges that we have to basically set up? Normally, we set it at 25. I think for uh, uh, this uh, COVID times, we'll have to make it 30 or 35. No, this is for the theater or for the OPD, sir? OPD, where, wherever there is a centralized uh, air conditioning unit with an AHU, you can put the dampener. So there you can control the fresh air exchange, but not for a split AC, as far as I, I know. So actually, what was said was the amount of fresh air that is coming, we don't expect the air from outside to be infected, you know. That's the main thing. So fresh air, if it is, uh, you're getting in more, you're keeping the fresh air inlet uh, more open. The only problem is that the temperature, maintaining a temperature of say 21, 22 or 23 as an ambient may not be there. It might go up to 28 or something like that. But how so, many, how many OPDs have AHU? It's it's a norm in the theater, but in the routine OPD, how many have AHUs? Nobody. Let's not make things complicated. It's not uh, possible for majority of the ophthalmologists to put it up. If we if we may make if we speak here that they are required and they are effective, I don't think so. It will uh, you know majority of our members are single practitioners. Yeah. So let's not uh, complicate yeah. things. I think in the guidelines, what we've recommended for the HA, the HAVC is uh, 20 exchanges per hour. Yeah, that 20, was, uh, 20 per hour. Not 30 for OPD. OPD, OPD we haven't really written anything. Uh, not written anything. For the OT, we have uh, uh, said, and this is with Ishray uh, knowledge, that uh, there is no problem. You can have uh, AHU or you can have split AC also. So we are not uh, saying that uh, if you have split ACs in OT, that you should not do it. So there is... The uh, people from Ashray uh, yesterday or day before uh, Bangalore, we were there and they were very categorical that the uh, there is a lot of uh, misinformation regarding the ACs and uh, getting fresh air from outside uh, is uh, not going to be counterproductive or counterintuitive. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Can we go on to the, to the next um, point that uh, we would like to... It is regarding the fever corner or the conjunctivitis kiosks that has been, you know, you know so what are the uh, essentials in that kiosk? Is it just to see uh, a few conjunctivitis patients in a day? You, you require a dedicated room. And do all the staff sitting there do have to wear a PPE? Kaushik, you want to come in on that? We don't have a kiosk as such. We attempted making one at one of our hospitals. Uh, I am part of another organization where we did uh, sample collection kiosks and we donated it to hospitals. There it makes sense for conjunctivitis, it probably doesn't because the number of cases that we see, it doesn't, uh, it gives you a false sense of security. So wearing, uh, like uh, Dr. Mahipal said, wearing a proper mask with a face cover, using a earbud and disinfecting your hand is probably much more effective than having this artificial barrier. In fact, patients come in and also tell us, hey, oh, it's great that they're able to see your face and you don't have anything barricading. Uh, so it's a question of mind game versus uh, the confidence you have in your process. Sometimes you have to do some of this to give confidence to your own staff. But at the end of the day, if you're particulars in your hand hygiene and other those basic fundamentals, I think you're better off there. Are there, sir, does Arvind have a fever kiosk, sir? I mean, uh, we, do, we don't have, but the right in the entrance, if we have a patient with conjunctivitis, they are seen there in an open area. We don't take them into your <laughs> They're seen in an open area, and from there, they're disposed. And they also get a package I mean, uh, of medication, so that the amount of time, they, they don't even have to go to the medical shop. It's also delivered right there itself. So basically, at the triaging level itself, that is taken care of. They're taken care of, they, they just leave. They don't go into the hospital, yeah. Madam? Yes, so I think you do require a triaging area for conjunctivitis patients. 
and uh, we have made one also and the staff who is going to be seeing there is going to be different but if the staff is wearing a pp wearing a mask and wearing a it could be a triple head mask and is well covered with the pp etc even if it is a covid suspect patient then it actually doesn't matter these are this is what we are you know following even at aims yeah but the okay. uh, we have a triage area we don't we've not created a booth as such We yeah. take the patients off to a separate area. Triage so, is critical. So the thing is that they have to be separated out. That is, I think, uh, very important. That they have to be segregated out into the other area and don't allow them to mi mix in the other area. Now, having said this, the incidence of conjunctivitis is, you know, varying from 0.9% in one study to 30% in the other study. With many studies showing that the concentration of the virus is very low in the tears. So all these things are there. But then, because it has already been uh, it has it is one of the manifestations or the complications or whatever so it is important to segregate these people out i think one point, yeah. that I, one point is the good thing is with the better hand hygiene the the incidence of conjunctivitis has come down considerably what we saw in now march february march is uh, not it's there much less, much less much less i think it's because of whatever we are doing for the corona and also helping to reduce that See, the point yeah. is that there should be no compromise. These are two different things that you asked. One was a fever thing, and the other is a conjunctivitis. From a fever perspective, there should be no compromise. That if a patient is having fever, do not let him enter into the eye care facility. That is something which you have to ensure because uh, those are the first signs of that, and you can tell the patient that. Yes, you have fever, you have sore throat, etc. So you have to go to a COVID facility, and we are not, we are not uh, tuned to handle COVID positive cases or suspect uh, COVID cases or whatever. So if you stop the patient with fever to enter, that is the most important thing that even all the international speakers in various webinars have uh, kind of said. And the history taking of a fever also uh, something very very important. You have cough and fever, etc. Regarding conjunctivitis, that is separate from fever. So, if a patient has conjunctivitis uh, without fever, then that is the question. And I think what Dr. R D R is saying is very, very uh, correct. That uh, if you can have it at a separate place, it depends on your. If you have a small setup, then it is better that maybe from outside only with a torchlight examination you can uh, possibly uh, say. But the point is that a slit lamp examination and a red eye becomes slightly important. Mm -hmm. so that is the only thing that if you miss out anything that's a problem ideally if there is a conjunctivitis you can do a teleconsult also so uh, but a fever patient should not be allowed into an eye care facility because what we have issued guidelines are for non covid facilities and we fall under non covid facilities so now regarding yeah patient should not you see triage him from outside only giving drops if he has no visual loss or no visual decrease You can, you know, without touching uh, the, without allowing him to go to pharmacy area, hand him uh, this, uh, you know, kit of uh, whatever RDR said, and ask him to review after five seven days in case there is no improvement. That yeah. also, that also can be done on a tele consultation. Like, you know, like where the patient sits in the slit lamp, even right from there, we have put a uh, vision chart where the patient can read. So if the patient don't have to go anywhere, just turn mm -hmm. that chart. He'll close the right eye, left eye, and do it. And again, this is the ideal cases for a telephone or a video consultation. After yeah, yeah. Days. Okay, sir. Can uh, the next point that I I want to clarify uh, is is the use of the gloves. Now, it has been mentioned in almost all the guidelines that you need to use a glove for all the procedures. The first one is, do you really need to use the glove for every patient, or do you have to wash your hands, okay. you know, disinfect your hands properly after every patient? and if you have to use what is the difference between the nitrile glove and the latex glove i mean uh, in in this perspective what is the main difference between these two so i think uh, regarding the gloves the government of india guidelines says that you have to use gloves for the ophthalmologists having said this in our international webinars a couple of international people did say that they are not using gloves they are just you know without using gloves Only wearing N95 and doing uh, examining the cases in between. What is recommended is the nitrile gloves as opposed to the uh, as opposed to the latex gloves, and that is mainly because the nitrile gloves they tend to be they are more robust. They tend to be you know more waterproof as compared to the latex gloves, which tend to stick to your uh, to your skin. 
So basically, from a glove perspective, there are two or three points which are of common sense. The first sense is first thing is that you can dispose these gloves, right? So if you have non-sterile gloves that you are using, you can get it for I don't know one or two or three rupees. It's not really expensive, and you can dispose of these gloves. The second thing is putting alcohol again and again on your hand. Uh, uh, it may be better to put it again and again on your gloves if you don't want to dispose of. So those are uh, two things that is there. They are easily disposable. Uh, they are not very costly. And uh, the second uh, thing is that you can uh, have them sterilized. Or even if you go again and again to open the top of the uh, of the tap and doing a hand wash with soap and for 20 seconds, etc. That could be. That's why gloves are recommended uh, from uh, that perspective. Mohan sir, sorry. Uh, About the gloves, uh, rubbing alcohol over the gloves, uh, according to some of the papers uh, which I have read, is after ten such disinfection of the gloves with seventy percent alcohol, you are supposed to change the gloves. Yeah, you throw them. Now, now, yeah. Number two, number two is that it gives you a false sort of uh, confidence that you can touch anywhere with the gloves. So instead of, uh, I mean, that is one way. The two things. The th- one idea that I would like to give you is, you are walking around with your fingers like this. You have a you have a tendency to touch anywhere you want, face, uh, desk, uh, reception area, that record, this record. So if you ask your staff to clench your fists and then all along during the duty hours. You know, you can't go on touching your eyes, mouth, and all that. It's very difficult with your gloves. So this is just one suggestion, just for all of you to practice. Probably it will work out. <laughs> yeah, so when we wear gloves in the OT, we are very careful not to touch anywhere we know. Yeah, yeah. But a common question, is, a common question which has come out from the audience is how frequently should we be cleaning the OPD surfaces? Like, well, is there a necessity for fogging the OPD on an everyday? So like that you do with the right, two to three hours, you should do a hypochlorite cleaning, etc. And uh, every at the end of the day, you should do fogging. That's what it says. So the things will change over time, but that's the uh, kind of uh, thing that has been said just now. Yes, sir, Mohan, sir. Right. I, I don't know about fogging. I think uh, surface cleaning is uh, well and good. That should be the. Uh, I think that should be good. the other thing which I wanted to give one more point. You will have computer terminals in uh, many of the places in nowadays. Please use a cling film on your keypad, on your mobile phone, when you reach the hospital, and when you leave, just pull it off and put it in that correct bin. And that is and over and above that, when when the surface is being cleaned. Even the cling film can be cleaned, and you can easily use your keypad. That's a very practical and you know easily doable thing. So there was one doubt from the audience regarding the um, actually it's already mentioned in the guidelines about the uh, transmissibility of the virus inside a perimeter bowl. So there has been you know concerns about. How the virus sticks to the because the patient sits in front of a perimeter for a long period of time. The company has recommended, I think, alcohol sterilization. Yeah. They have uh, recommended an alcohol spray, this and uh, the, there was a lot of uh, discussion by the glaucoma group because the glaucoma subspeciality people did it, and uh, they came to a conclusion that uh, Zeiss has already recommended for Humphrey, and likewise other companies would have recommended. and we should follow as per the company's guidelines because if something happens to the device then they will create a problem in the amc and the cmc so whatever the manufacturer you know says that should be uh, followed and the company rec- recommends a alcohol spray for it so there are this i would add routine routine screening uh, of glaucoma suspects and routine perimetry can be delayed also it's yeah. not uh, must that you keep carrying on this perimetry as you were doing it only for neurological causes it may be relatively urgent but for glaucoma follow ups i think uh, two or three uh, or two months or so can be delayed easily so what dr lalit has said is the first part the second part is that within zeiss itself there are they have written two contradictory things the first thing they have said is they said spray alcohol of 
but on the other hand they have said uh, they have also said that the inside of the bowl should not be touched uh, because it can spoil the thing so there is definitely the one important thing that everybody uh, is in agreement is that you can use alcohol in between patient for the chin and the headrest that is mandatory and the patient should be wearing a new fresh mask at the time when the patient is uh, actually uh, sitting there and as uh, what dr lalit said that it is ideal to uh, reduce the number of fields uh, until of course you feel that there is a loss in vision etc etc that a field is required so uh, a, a swiss uh, ophthalmologist said that uh, you should be treating a glaucoma person as if you are going to see him again after 3 to 6 months yeah so as per the guidelines they say that do visual fields only if necessary yes. for diagnosis planning or changing that management gopal tell me when we have to switch on to surgery because we have to allot some time for surgical things also dr yeah. dr kaushik has to say something yeah when you doing the visual fields i think it is critical to remember to clean the trial frame and the lenses they are much more than the perimeter so like i said i think we need to remember the fundamentals first rather than start uh, working on assumptions so definitely the lenses need to be clean between the patient okay i had one, one question audience. for uh, mahipal you see suppose a uh, uh, patient is coming to center for sight and he does not uh, agree for arogya setu download <laughs> this happened today in the this happened today in the opd no, that, that is mandatory as per the mandatory. guidelines for the patient and the attendant both yes you can refuse them you can make them download it at that particular time and then come so what if he does not have a smartphone sorry what if he doesn't have a smartphone so the i we have a right to refuse a patient right until of course it's an emergency then under the emergency one uh, have one is interested otherwise as a private practitioner you have a right to say that i will not see a particular uh, patient you have a patient who comes in drunk you can uh, refuse to see him so similarly if a patient is there are these are the protocols which are the government protocols that you have to have the arogya setu you are not willing to download it so i would uh, refuse to see you in and even if he calls the police or something like that the police is going to support you than him because uh, they have to also uh, that's uh, i think mandated by law today that you have to have the arogya setu okay, one 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 question is coming railway, railway thing now the rails have opened even to get into that railway you are uh, uh, you, you need arogya setu yeah you need arogya yeah one question is uh, earlier aios guidelines have been issued for health workers to use chloroquine Sorry, so what is the status of Chloro chloroquine now? Chloroquine. chloroquine. It's still the same. It's still the yeah. same for the yeah. By the ICMR, they have not changed. It, it is that seven-week uh, thing that was originally mentioned. Yeah. 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 Now feet. it's seven weeks. Two hundred. Should we continue? <laughs> Sorry. So it is Gopal only meant for people who are in charge of COVID patients. Yes. It's not. <laughs> Only if, are, if only if you are treating COVID patients. COVID patients. Okay. You must. Yeah. Okay. COVID hospitals. Yeah. one one question that i received is is uh, to namrata madam what about uh, micro keratoma lasik uh, uh, there is something that it creates aerosols uh, or is... there was a lot of discussion in the refractive surgery group as to micro keratoma lasik does it create aerosol or does prk create more aerosol or does or does smile create less aerosol so these were the kind of deliberations we had and we finally concluded that as of now there is nothing to prove or to say that micro keratoma will cause more aerosol or prk will cause more aerosol so we can because there's nothing proven there's nothing in literature as well and it is not there as per anybody's experience also so we kept quiet on it we didn't say that aerosol although oh, we did say one has to be cautious as far as the laser surgery is being done because that may generate aerosols no so is this just to cautious. all precautions have to be taken Yuda, is this just to protect the interest of lasik surgeons or, or yeah. because there is a potential <laughs> error realization no, 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 here no sir but there is no no proven uh, uh, no proven literature or experience which says so and people have started uh, refractive surgery like dr john chang said that they have started 100% refractive surgery in hong kong and uh, they have not had any problem so it's yes, not based on namrata the one But one thing that is very clear is which obviously we didn't because it could be supportive of a company but one thing that has come out very clear is that smile is going to be having no aerosols because you are not burning any tissue so smile is not going to have any aerosol 
uh, when you are using the microkeratome, yes, there could be uh, the uh, splashing of uh, aerosol. But the modern thing there, which everyone has said, is that you should clean with povidine iodine. In the cul-de-sac, have povidine iodine. So if there is anything, uh, there is no aerosol that is produced with something that is infective. So that is the thing. And even yesterday, John Chang said that in case there is uh, the uh, vapor that is there when you are doing the uh, PRK, etc., then under those circumstances, he would want to keep that the last so that he can uh, have uh, air exchange after that. But smile today would possibly be the best procedure where there will be the least or no, there will be no aerosol at all. The other thing is that even when you are doing, uh, there are there was some suggestion that you should uh, keep yourself away and uh, look at the screen only when the ablation is happening or even when you are looking at the microscope, there is a big enough difference between where the eye of the patient is and where the microscope is. But yes, definitely the other thing is that when you are using an ablation, it is itself a sterilizing laser. The laser itself, uh, when it burns, it sterilizes. So there is no concrete evidence per se, but yes, if you want plume or the other thing that they said is that you could actually in some machines like Schwind, etc., you can actually have the vacuum aspiration started earlier. Uh, than when the laser is fired. So you can actually be, and like Vizex, there are a lot of machines where you have a plume evacuator. So that can reduce the amount of plume that is coming towards the surgeon. So these are obviously things which are there, but betadine has come out to be very, or poverty and iodine has come out to be very strongly to be something that we should use for all kinds of surgery, whether it is cataract, retina, etc., even LASIK that you should have poverty and iodine put in the cul-de-sac after putting a drop of topical anesthesia so that uh, there is sterility of the cul-de-sac. I think in American Academy of Guidelines also, Dr. Shadoosh has mentioned that COVID-19 is virucidal and so it should be used. Okay, so during Gopal, a I think we should go. would you do a PP, yeah. would you use a PP also? A cataract or a LASIK procedure? Do you, would you... You're wearing your, you're, you're wearing your mask, you're wearing your goggles, you're wearing your gloves. At 95, you're wearing uh, your goggles or triple lead or N95 and linen gown, oblique disposable gum. Okay, okay. Uh, shall we go on to uh, Gopal? If there are no yeah. more questions from there, shall we yeah. go on to Dr. Shashi and uh, look at the operation theater qu uh, queries? Shashi, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we will come to the OT, OT module. See, COVID times, uh, there are special times that it needs uh, some special precautions. So, do you suggest any special points to be stressed during the counseling, patient counseling? Hard year, sir. Sir, you are muted, sir. Yeah, we have a few points, you know, when we discuss with them, basically about uh, bringing only one attender along with them. And once they the fix an appointment for surgery, we, we ask them not to have to any social gathering, stay at home, even before surgery and maybe like about 10, 10 days after surgery. And then, you know, when they come, the, the day before they come, I think we'll call them and uh, to find out if there is any kind of a fever history or any contact with people with the fever. I think uh, I mean, uh, many other things, you know, to asking them to wear a very clean dress and then bring a mask. We you now we have decided to give that mask in the hospital. A set of guidelines, we'll give it to them at, at the time of uh, them a surgery, time of counseling. We got we have we kind of have a discussion and then we are finalizing them. Maybe as we start admitting patients, I think the guidelines also become much more clearer. Anything extra, madam? I think uh, if you have investigated the patient beforehand and then uh, scheduled the surgery later, it is again uh, important to go through the same uh, uh, same uh, pre-op, uh, same thing, you know, triaging thing that have you had fever, or sore throat, etc. Because in between the investigation and the day you plan the surgery, he may still have symptoms. So you need to uh, know that even on the day when he comes for surgery. So in that context, context we should uh, uh, discuss about this COVID testing also. You said you can do COVID testing for uh, high-risk patients. So will you insist on RT-PCR or a, uh, 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 IgG or IgM? So I think COVID testing as per government of India is not, not recommended for any cases and we are not, we are not operating COVID patients because we are all non-COVID. What, what about high risk patients, ma'am? Uh, patients on dialysis? So you have to, uh, 
even those patients are not going to be we are not going to be doing covid testing in some of the private hospitals in delhi and i think uh, world uh, country wide has been people are doing it but the problem is that it's not available in all the centers and all the cities so we couldn't put that as we can't put that in the guidelines saying that you know it is but it's the one for high risk cases with high morbid uh, with with morbidities which are higher you could get a covid test done for for high risk patients like on dialysis immunocompromised and ga patients i think it does make logical uh, this thing that it should be done it may be done so we've not made it mandatory in the in the guidelines we've not made it mandatory there is so we have advised that you know that patients with hypertension and diabetes and all that you may no hypertension diabetes nahi kyunki wo to 50% of population will be covered uh, of helping population yeah because, uh, very, a lot of our patient but that is not an issue yeah so from practical view point i think uh, maybe diabetes and immuno compromise can yeah. be done ga patients and dcr and uh, other sir in our our uh, center even for ga patients we are not doing covid even when they are doing their emergency surgeries we are not doing covid test basically the problem is that uh, these uh, guidelines are so very dynamic that this guidelines came basically because of the lack of testing kits so that is why earlier the thing was icmr prohibited that there is only and in some states the number of kits are so few that they do not allow it's it's a pain to actually get a covid test done for a patient who is not suffering from any symptoms or he has not visited a covid facility etc so as the availability of the kits increases so now they are talking about herd testing or uh, community testing etc so i think as the availability of these kits uh, uh, increase then uh, one can be more liberal in getting it done but the hospitals which have testing ability like in delhi max or a portals or a blp or whatever it is so they are insisting on actually getting the test done for all the patients for surgery because a uh, lot of patients went in for surgery came out covid positive and matlab basically the morbidity of a patient who had covid and was undergoing a long ga procedure uh, was much higher cardiac problems or myocarditis etc people are presenting with myocarditis etc even pregnancy they, they have found that 20% of the pregnant ladies are having covid positive so they can have a problem so it is going to change but the guideline has changed from the fact that you are not allowed to do it to so saying that it is not mandatory so there is is nothing that it is illegal now to ask a patient to get a covid test done and as lalit is saying i would say if you have old people who have comorbidity and people uh, children who are going to have a longer anesthesia where there is an intubation extubation that is going to happen uh, it may be a wise enough thing to go ahead and get a covid test done the other thing is that a covid test can have false negative it is only in about 70% so that again is a, a small little problem that is there but it is a uh, grouping in dark i would say uh, if uh, the patient can get, get it done for uh, these conditions uh, it may be a wise idea to get it done the think- problem i faced was that it has to be done a few days before only couple of days like one of my patient got testing done a week back so and said it is refused he said Report has to be one or two days old only. You can't have one it week has, old COVID test and then say okay. It has to be two days old. G again to give. Yeah. What about chest X-ray? In our uh, in, in our center, we are not getting COVID testing and we are not getting X-ray chest also. X-ray chest. Okay. In terms of uh, uh, pre-op, there is just uh, two things that we've started doing. Is one uh, we're suggesting a PTD in car gel. So what it is, what we thought that can help. The second thing that we advise patients is to practice with a mask on. and put a towel on their face and lie down so that kind of helps with them cooperate much better during the surgery those are two things that we have now initiated so mask is mandatory for patient coming in uh, you have to give the patient a fresh mask when the patient is entering the ot and he goes out also wearing a mask and then that has to be disposed so that is the additional thing that has been added that from a hygiene perspective and the hands of the patient has to be sanitized before he comes in so those are the mask and the sanitization and head uh, hold that you were always making them wear so that uh, the these two additional things are there some people were also advising we haven't put it that a pulse oximeter a pulse oximetry can be done at the entrance mm. uh, but uh, that's uh, because the, i think that not everybody is doing it so again we did not put and it's not there in any guidelines 
I think video by Arvind Hospital says that pulse oximetry. I saw that video, RDR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, are, we, are, we are doing it for the, all the patients. If they admitted for surgery, at the time of form filling, <laughs> they do it. And then when they get admitted, maybe like every two hours or three hours, we check it. And also during the surgery. But there can be many other reasons for uh, low oxygen. Low oxygen. Yeah, then you know, we refer them to the physician to get an opinion. Based on that, we do it. So anybody less than 96, they go to the physician for the opinion. Less than, so less than 96 percent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Regarding the, the pay, officers have started insisting on it. Regarding the oh. mass that we are giving to the patient when they are when they are taken to the OT, can we uh, accept the mass that they have brought, or should we give it in the OT itself? No, it is. We are planning to give it in the OT. Yes, but it's it's better that you give it to the OT because you don't yeah. know the step. The status of that yeah. mask the patient is getting. Yeah, I agree. One question regarding the biometry uh, Which should you, I mean, it's the non contact is the best, but if people are having only the contact uh, the biometry probe uh, or even the immersion probe, is there any precautions that we have to take? Alcohol. So 70% isopropyl alcohol, they have to be sterilized with. That is what we have written, even for the immersion sc scan, the, the pragar or that. Thing can be also sterilized with the same thing. Yeah. But as much as possible, uh, optical coherence biometry whenever available. Yeah, whenever available. Yeah, uh, yeah, that is the safer one. Yeah. Yes, yes. But a lot of people don't have it. Don't have. Correct, correct, correct. Another is uh, how many patients can be scheduled per session or per day in an OT? OT. Yeah. I think. Uh, so there, we've not given any guidelines for that. How many number of patients? Only thing we've said is that. Uh, there should be adequate time in between the two patients so that you can do surface cleaning of the surfaces. And uh, in GA, as far as the general anesthesia is concerned, even, which includes the ophthalmologist and the nursing staff, etc., and the assistant, then go inside. And after the patient is extubated, again, wait for 20 minutes. But as far as LA is concerned, uh, we've not given the numbers. But having said this, I think each one of us is starting now when we are restarting at around 20 to 25 percent of our original OPD or OT or whatever. That would also depend on the number of teams and number of you know surgeons available. But we have not we have not said that it should be per surgeon so many or whatever. We have, we have uh, mentioned about 20 minutes gap between the patients to allow. That, that's for general. That's for general anesthesia, yeah. not for local anesthesia. Even for local cases, uh, I mean, do you uh, uh, prefer a surface disinfection between yeah. the cases? Surface and the floor, if you want hypo yeah, floor. floor. Uh, and UV. what about the UV towers that that are available now? UV lights towers can be kept in the OT between cases, which will uh, uh, disinfect in about 10 minutes. Mohan, sir? Uh, UV lights, it, it can, uh, after the surface cleaning with hypochlorite solution or any such... Uh, uh, solution is necessary, but then what you have to do is UV light doesn't act on shadows. If there is a shadow, that area will not be covered by the UV light. And then uh, you have to have a correct uh, energy. Uh, you have to, let's say, if, if you have a, a 10 into 10 into 10 theater, you need about eight tubes of 36 watts each. You have to put it in the center of the room for five minutes. I believe all the surfaces will be clean. But it will not act in the presence of dirt or soil. So Clean. the basic cleaning should be there. Cleaning is and really after that, this is only an additional this thing that you can use. So if over the air, 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 air will not be sterilized with so UV light. One important thing for UV light, because everyone is talking about UV light. <laughs> I have suffered it personally, myself, Noshir, uh, Ravijit, etc. We had gone to Patna or someplace to do a live surgery demonstration. And that was being done in a makeshift OT. This is, I, I'll say this was about more than 18, 19, 15, 17 years ago. And when we were all there, we did not realize there were UV lights all around. Because they were you trying cannot. to uh, that such a bad keratitis. Yeah. That, uh, uh. So I think we need to re-emphasize that if we are uh, inside the OT and the UV light is out, you will cause a lot of harm to your eyes. Yeah. That needs to be re-emphasized because everyone is talking UV, UV, UV. So this, can happen. So if ever you are using UV, you have to do it after the surface cleaning. Is it? Is, is that? Yeah, okay? uh, in between, in between that gap. 
Yeah, but nobody should be present inside the theater at that particular time. So just okay. after the surgery, clean the surfaces, then put UV if you want, and then do the next five surgery. minutes. And then yeah. But but you have an age shift, it may not be required. Like Dr. Namita mentioned, if you are having the 15 but, minutes, six or seven air changes will happen. So in an age shift, UV does not help because the air is constantly changing. Okay. Sir, it is not, it is, sir, it is not about air. It is it, it acts only on surfaces. Surface, yes. But the question is, it acts on surface means you have to keep what surface you want to sterilize. You see, for 10 by 10 by 10, you can't sterilize the entire room. It does not act on it, air. Yeah. If you have the yes, correct... If the OT trolley, OT trolley or, or the table, they, there only you can keep it. Yeah, but that, that alcohol will do a better I think, job. Uh, I think right. what, was, what was being discussed was that the surface cleaning, when you do that itself, uh, yeah. Comes into action within seven to ten minutes, and that is also the time you know when the patient will go in and the next patient will come out. So you actually don't need, need anything except for surface cleaning. That was the point which was discussed in the subcommittee meeting. Yeah. Okay. One very question which has come, madam, is Dr. that Mohan, sir, there are multiple tables. Right. Would you agree with that surface cleaning part? Sir? Surface, yeah, cleaning? surface yeah. cleaning is, is, is a must. Important. You just cannot do ever with it. This this is a fancy item which has come recently. It has been there before also, but the only thing is that people uh, put a one tube light with a blue color and say it is UV. It is not UV. <laughs> so you have to, you, if it acts, it has to be something like, uh, let's say, 48 millijoules per centimeter square. That kind of energy should be there if, if something has to happen with UV light. Otherwise, nothing. No. So basically, yes, go, go the light is used routinely yeah, so yeah. and that is uh, with the cover and which is also a purifier with it. So these PCI and also all my LASIK OTs, Femto OTs, they have a this thing, but that is covered. So that can be kept on while the procedure is on. But it exactly. takes time for it to uh, this thing. But if it's a tube light uh, uncovered, that is going to be a problem with people in. Gopal, sir, one question was there. There are many theaters with multiple tables, like two tables side by side. So what would be the situation in such a theater? Should we make it a single table theater and operate? Uh, Madam, especially in government hospitals, such a that's, a, that's a great question because RP Center also has operation theater with two tables and you know it very well. So when we are starting, we are going to only do one table there and with one surgeon. And uh, we'll see how it goes in the coming weeks and then change accordingly. Yeah, as Mahipal said, yes, it's it all content. dynamic. Yeah. What, is going to know. what is going to happen to residents and fellows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Aravind, also, we have, we have the double yes, system, sir. Oh, yes, two sir. table system. Some, yeah, some theaters, maybe we have up to four, maybe two hours, two surgeons operate. And many hospitals also have only split ACs. I think in the, the transition period, we are just going to have one table, one surgeon, and then a very limited number of people. And we are also, for all the split AC theaters, we are also designing a real circulation system. We are trying oh. to, to come up with a, a stand, standalone unit, which will have HEPA and also vertically aligned UV mm -hmm. lamps. I mean, it, we are so looking at something like that, that will have about two by two, and it will have a height of about five to six feet. And then, you know, which will also have about 20 air circulation units. I mean, all that, you know, we are trying to calculate based on the volume of the thing. I think if it uh, happens, I think we should have much better air sterilization within the OT. Is that yeah. an FFU fan filter unit? Are you, are you making these structural changes now or are you going to wait to make them? No, no, we are just, you know, the design is, part is all over. It is under construction. One unit we are going to make and then see. Because, you know, I mean, normally these fans can make a lot of noise if it is going to be inside. So we are trying to get those low noise fans, which will be able to suck in enough amount of air. So that, you know, we we'll have air circulation at least 20 times as uh, what was recommended in the AOS guideline. We are trying to achieve that. So Auro Lab is working on that. Hopefully we'll have Auro Lab and few vendors are working on that. So hopefully it, it'll happen. So it just, they, you just push it into the OT, is it? The only way we can kill the virus, they say it's only UV light. No other way we can kill it. The HEPA filter can to some extent filter it, but not all. But the ideal option is to have UV light. And again, having this UV light vertically aligned makes the whole 
unit also much taller. So there, there are some of the issues we have. So. Okay, sir. Thank two, you. two questions. Two questions are there. HEPA filter, routine HEPA filter. I think it is 0.3 microns or so, or three microns. And yes. whereas you need yeah, point three, point. Point 0.3 micron. Yeah. So the, 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 the HEPA filter at 0.3 micron, it will have filtration now about 99.99 percent. Yeah. So your virus is like 0.1 percent. Even there, there will be certain level of filtration. It doesn't mean that it doesn't filter 0.1. It filters 0.1. But may not be to the level of 0.3, maybe like 90 percent. But still, definitely, you'll be able to reduce the load. And the second is that the virus oh, is a droplet. Once it's tagged to a droplet, it will become much larger. And also, the smaller particles have a Brownian motion, so they kind of get stuck in the mesh. So having discussed with a lot of the PPE guys, that's what they have suggested. So a 0.3 micron HEPA is good enough. Since RP Center has a lot of fellows and residents, and Arvind also has dependent on fellows and residents, and we say in COVID era, surgery should be done by experienced person, fast as possible, less time in the OT, all these things. So what is going to you know be the balance, right balance? And no camps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a difficult situation. I think that is something which is genuinely going to suffer. Yeah. Because yeah. as it is, you're going to have less number of cases and that too being done by more experienced people. So, are you right to be... Before I ask, Namrata and RDR. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, you know... Some people will genuine, genuinely suffer. We'll have to, you know, this will go like a, uh, like a zero year for them. Only they will be uh, trained in the medical uh, kind of, clinical kind of a thing and not surgical. So, that is something that will really suffer. The DNBS actually sent a letter uh, to our institution saying that you have to extend the DNB period by a few months. By okay. six months? No, I think three months they have said initially. Lost the connection. So from our institution, one, what we have done is we have postponed all the fellowship program by three months. They okay. Not taking new fellows. Second, the existing fellows who are all finishing this month or next month, we have told them the chances of you getting more cases is not there. In these two months, and if you want, you know, it's optional. You can extend your program by by two or three months, or if you feel confident enough, you can uh, leave the fellowship. Yeah, yeah, leave the fellowship. You can do the. No, but I don't think this situation. They are not going to get cases for the next six months, even in two three months' true. time. True, it's true. It's not going to. Exactly. It's not going to right. get any better for them, at least. Yes. So yes. Maybe, maybe you can give them give them a second chance later on, madam. After six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they lose out on the time. Namrata, I just keep forgetting. Please, uh, from AIOS side, uh, we need to send a letter to uh, the, to DNB to uh, yeah. have the government to have the government pay for the fees because that was already in the offing. I think this might be the time that we can uh, uh, kind of get it through. So just remind me, we should send out that letter. Uh, and yes, sir. Uh, another thing is that previously we used to wear the same gown for about four to five cases and change the gloves in between. So right now, should we change the gowns uh, for every case, especially if it is a cataract case? So in case the gown is wet, then you have to change it. So if it is soiled or wet, then it has to be changed. If it is not... Because of this COVID times, should we change? Because we are changing everything when we are, we are giving a 20 minutes gap. So should we change the uh, well, surgeon's gown? Under topical anesthesia and all, we are not asking for a 20-minute gap. That's uh, not required. It's only for GA cases that we are asking for. And typically, it's your decision whether you want. So uh, the shoe covers can be done, which you normally don't have if you have slippers and all. So that uh, just to protect that. But apart from that, ideally, if you ask me, ideally, even in US and for every other thing, they have changed for even doubt, even if COVID was not there. So that is the ideal thing that one has to do. But otherwise, if it is not soiled or there isn't water, because that is something that is emphasized. But yes, if you uh, do that, that's much better. And another thing about the linen sheets, because many of the hospitals, they use, still use linen sheets. Uh, right now, should we shift to uh, disposable sheets or uh, can we continue with the linen sheets? So there was a lot of discussion on this and they were in hypochlorite, the linen sheet. No, we did say, yeah, we did say that the linen sheets, because we know that places where there are high volume surgeries which are going on there, they would still have linen sheets and not have disposable sheets. So it was, what was discussed was that they can immediately be put into sodium hypochlorite and, 
and dealt with you know as one would linen gowns for that matter dear sir wo to autoclave hoti hai na sheets wagera ye koi hoti hai magar rimming ke liye usme wo soil ho gayi na matlab agar naak ke paas hai so that is why But that's what. Yes, doctor. Earlier you would be able to say. Hey, the, our plan is to have a rexin sheet on the table, which can be cleaned, wiped with the alcohol uh, disinfectant, and then we are planning to give a disposable gown for the patient, so which will be you now covering the whole body, so which may not need a, another drape. You know, we do not use a linen drape on the patient, you know, a bed sheet or something we can avoid. So. that's a kind of we are trying to simplify that so we may not use any linen bed sheet in the operating room on no, bed sheet is something different we are talking about eye drapes then eye drapes is got a plastic drapes normal drapes that we have no yeah, normal normal drape, normal drape, drape whatever that's not going to change no, you are not you are going to not put any linen i hope the incidence of uh, end off and all does not because you normally have an eye drape uh, which is of uh, cotton and then you put the uh, plastic drape on top of that yes yes so now probably will use a plastic drape for everybody yeah dr kaushik any any other uh... not again we've been using a plastic drape in the community side for the last few years what dr bypar was saying what we figured is that you need to probably paint much better and much wider because you have an ingress of the water coming in so once you do that we've not seen any increase in the end of pain where linen is used some of our surgeons continue to use a linen and then put a plastic drip like sir mentioned we as it immediately put it in a close bin with 1000 hypochlorite it gets slaughtered and goes into the organ 1000 hypochlorite is a protect our laundry stuff so that's the whole idea another thing is about the humidity relative humidity in the ot humidity is ideal for uh, fungi and bacteria and kerala is a place where there are a lot of humidity so what 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 is the effect of humidity on the virus some some people say that uh, low humidity is good for viruses so what should be the optimum humidity for uh, ot i think uh, go ahead yeah. what, what is recommended yeah what is recommended for uh, any 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 madam so, ashreyas ashreyas written between 30 to 60 percent 30 to 50 40 to 50 is the ideal 40 to 50 is the ideal thing but then the low humidity the viruses will proliferate that is what they say if you have more air exchanging you have fresh air coming in negative pressure those kind of things then the humidity maintenance is going to be a problem so that's why the range has been slightly increased that is what they have said but typically but, i think uh, uh, they have said uh, 30 to 50 uh, lalit is saying 40 to 50 i think they have said 30 to 50 and yes. some people are recommended 30 to 60 also there was a lot of discussion on that so we could not figure out as to what to say so we have written nothing about temperature and humidity in the ot because there are so many differing opinions about it that uh, it's uh, really we couldn't come to any conclusion so uh, in couple of places we have uh, decided to remain silent and the uh, temperature and humidity in the ot is one of them in some hospitals they are planning to put a it's classically the humidity is at one down. place it's also written 30 to 70% and uh, that is what i'm i'm reading it from a document which dr uh, nirmal frederick had sent us that's a He big range 30 to 70% usually it's around at one place it is 30 to 50% at other place third place it is 30 to 60% yeah. the fact that you have such a big range means you are not clear Ah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Average <laughs> somewhere is about fifty-five percent. Yeah, yeah. Forty to fifty. Forty to fifty is the usual uh, is recommended. But if you go yeah. below thirty, there is a chance of fire fire hazard. Yeah. Low humidity like, means uh, fire hazard. Like, yeah, like uh, Kerala, Chennai is also a place where the humidity is very high. So some yeah. hospitals are planning to put uh, heaters in the yeah, de- H H max. Yeah. Yeah, you can have dehumidifiers. Yeah. Okay. To control. Yeah. Heater in the age you actually works very well. Yeah, heater so in the age. Gopal, it's nine. You just look at the time also. Yeah. It's two, uh, exactly were... two hours since we started. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, the another another question is about the the aerosol generation in IoT. People, there are there are a lot of people who say that Keiko is a uh, uh, generates fire uh, the aerosol. Some people say vitrectomy generates uh, aerosol. So, what is the general take on that, my, my pulser? 
So aerosol is definitely going to be generated in phaco emulsification, but the problem or the situation as we see and what we have advised is that first of all, povidine iodine is something very, very essential. So the cul-de-sac is sterile, it's viricidal, so you don't have uh, any virus there. The second thing is that if, uh, if at all there is anything in the aqueous, which again has not been documented, you are uh, first putting viscoelastic when you're doing capsulorexes, etc. Then you are doing hydro. Then you are putting in BSS. So if at all some aerosol is generated and it is coming out, it is of BSS, uh, which is supposed to be sterile. So the aerosol of something which is infective, uh, carrying an infective viral load is not there. So that is the thing uh, uh, which is uh, which uh, uh, the American virologist PhD James Shadosh has. So he has given a personal communication and that's what the American Academy has also said. So yes, uh, you know, and that is why we recommended that you should not be uh, trying to uh, have your fake work outside in the open and things like that. But uh, I think the aerosol that is going to be there, and that's why even in LASIK, like the microkeratome is going to definitely produce some aerosol. So, povidine iodine, povidine iodine is something which is very, very important that you need to keep it with a contact time, which should be, uh, we have increased it to two minutes uh, now uh, rather than 60 to 90 seconds. So that's what uh, is very, very important. And a larger surface, as he was saying, of uh, povidine iodine, and even alcohol can be used after the povidine iodine. That can also be. So that is uh, what the situation is regarding vitrectomy. Dr. Lalit will be able to uh, tell. So for vitrectomy, uh, you see, it's a close surgery, but uh, what I feel is that it should be a, it should be a well cannulas because if you have a non-well cannulas, then a lot of fluid, uh, you know, tends to come out. As for the other thing is about the diathermy. So surface diathermy is another thing which is uh, prone for aerosol generation, but within the you know bipolar diathermy, uh, within the vitreous cavity does not harm much. So well cannulas is the answer actually. Gopal? Uh, yeah, so uh, now there are some questions regarding legal aspects of COVID and its uh, uh, you know problems. This is a never ending story. So people coming with uh, uh, with the problems with ophthalmology OPD, going back five days later, there was a COVID, or you know, had a COVID test which is negative, and then got a surgery done, and then went out after one week, got a COVID. How are we going to look at these legal issues? There are a lot of questions from the audience on that. Paypal, can you take this? <laughs> nobody, nobody's answering this. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know my pal, my pal will answer this. I will no, answer this. Uh, Can you repeat? Getting it. Oh, so there was somebody I had said that I. Had uh, regarding the legal aspect of it, uh, uh, there is no ordinance or anything that is by the government to provide safety. Uh, the U.S. has done the same, uh, not in India so far, but uh, uh, there is nothing preventing anybody to give 500 rupees and to go to a consumer court and saying that there was uh, a particular negligence, etc., etc., and I got COVID. So that is why the consent for the property. And in the consent form, we have specifically written that uh, 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 even though we have taken precautions, there is a possibility that you could get COVID. But all what the lawyers are saying is, yes, anybody can put a case, but it is going to be next to impossible to somebody to prove yeah. that the COVID has been acquired from the hospital. It is not like an HIV infection or a hep C, etc., which you need a, a cut or a, a, a transfusion or something like that, because this is an aerosol or a fomite or a, the atmosphere, which you can, so even if you are walking outside, you can get it. So uh, the proof of onus, uh, uh, the onus of proof lies on the patient to prove that it has been acquired from this particular thing. Even if the patient says that I had a COVID test done before and then I uh, got COVID, that also cannot be, uh, should not be held uh, in the court. But in case these kind of uh, provisions, uh, these kind of cases, etc., come, so in the epidemic act, the government can go ahead and uh, say that these cases will not be allowed. But as things stand today, there is no carpet or a blanket uh, uh, immunity that is there for uh, healthcare professionals just now in India. But overseas, there are uh, uh, countries which have said that uh, regarding COVID and the management of COVID that has happened, uh, the uh, doctors or this thing, until of course there is a gross negligence or some something, then otherwise by far there is a protection. But the problem is that they can still disturb your mind. Huh? 
That can happen even without COVID, no sir. Yeah. yeah. Now the next question comes to Dr. Namrata, madam. Uh, like in the government setup, they require a order from the government, a government order to start doing routine surgery. The government order is there. Yeah. The so, government order is there, but we are not governed by the government since we are autonomous. Our OPD, as per the AIMS director, no, no, the is usual government <laughs> setup in Kerala, madam. Yes. <laughs> we'll start from 20th. Yes, so. No. What is your question, Gopal? Yeah, the question is that uh, the Kerala government also issued a government order somewhere on 8th of May, uh, but they wanted some clarification from that. So, if there is a government order that you can order, you can do routine surgeries, then you can do as usual. Is that the thing? Yes, yes. you can do with precautions which are. And guidelines which are given by AIOS, but then you can start if the government orders is there. I think ministry has issued an order, you can do. No, no, state yes. just, central government has issued an order, but health is a state subject. So every yeah. state has given its own orders, like West Bengal has given a different order, Kerala would give a different order, Maharashtra would say, why are you closing, we will, you know, uh, penalize you for this. So you have to follow. The central government, of course, is there, but you have to follow your state government orders. I believe it's a herd effect. Once a, one, one, set, one setup starts, other will start also. No, but Gopal, is there an order that you cannot do surgeries? No, no. There, no, is no, no. there, is, there should be an order that you should be stopping surgery. Stopping? No, stopping. stopping. No, but stopping. When, for elective surgeries. But no, is there an order now you can start? Now, now, now the order has come. So you should order has come, no? Kerala. Yes. Yeah, it has come. Sir, is yeah. there any any change in the post of schedule of post of visits? The reduction in the post of uh, visits is the only change. Otherwise, so uh, you will have to see the patients as before. Yeah. Really consult post operatively as much as possible and call them only if there's a problem. I think ophthalmologists will have to learn this art of television more uh, than what we are practicing now. Yeah, yeah. That is the way forward. Even after COVID, I think telemedicine is something that you know we need to. You use. see, apart from Arvind, other people also have to learn now. <laughs> <laughs> so the last is there, question. Is there any you... special uh, special uh, uh, conservation for uh, intravitreal injections? Should we take any precautions or any kind of the usual usual theater precautions? Gopal, okay. any, any other question? Gopal, I think, last yeah. Question. The last one, question. One uh, question. It's been a very, yeah, very yeah, Lalit sir is asking sir. something. Yeah. One question I wanted to ask Arvind uh, as well as Maipal primarily. Because uh, you see all of us go are uh, going to start or have started uh, elective surgeries. We're going to triage, uh, you know, at every level. PP equipment and hand sanitization, distancing, more, more number of hours, less salaries for people. So many things. So are you going to revise your fee by <laughs> because uh, it is a it is sensitive that. issue. Because uh, I think uh, RDR had hinted about one line I heard, but uh, wanted to ask. No, so, no, no. Yeah, yeah. The, the only point I was making is for I know it's just I know it's a sensitive issue. The majority of you will say no, but. Uh, the I fee think for the of investment. You mean the fee for the patients? Yeah. yeah whatever extra we are going to spend for the patient, we are going to charge the patients. So actually, the government will not. When you go to panel patients, you go to CGHS, CCHS, and you go to the TPAs, uh, they will not uh, be willing to reimburse that. And when you are looking at the cash pay patients uh, with the deep recession in the economy, they may not have enough cash to pay. So it's going to be a problem. So uh, I, for one, believe that if we stay alive and get out of this uh, thing, and if the company stays alive, that will be the biggest profit that we will be getting this year. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we are in trouble. So see, basically, I am uh, looking. Uh, I for uh, if I look at uh, center of a site, I had budgeted that I will be able to get 30% uh, of the revenue in May as compared to what I had budgeted earlier, but I am only at 7%. So that means that today uh, I would have uh, lost at center per side maybe an additional uh, three and a half crores for a month. 
and what happens the problem is that uh, we would be set force majeure for april now that we are opening with very little of uh, uh, in inflow the rentals will start so the issue is it's going to be dramatically uh, a different uh, normal that is going to be there and uh, there uh, whether you charge the patient more or you reduce your uh, cost that is that have to happen rather the cost will increase so i really don't know matlab it's going to be a, a terrible situation i would say because one has to plan and uh, at times uh, i don't know i don't still have the answers and it's a very very evolving so every 15 days we are doing a budgeting and now we have done a budgeting to see that if we are only 40% or 50% of what we had done last year uh, how much of loss we have and how much of uh, sustenance we'll be able to do so i think there'll be a lot of financial turmoil a lot of people can go belly up so i really don't know the worst is still ahead of us same thing so we may be losing like 50 to 60 crores is my estimation for the next 2 3 months 2 months so far uh, that uh, i think uh, we'll yeah yeah i think uh, that has been an exhaustive few hours of explaining that, that's a bad note to end on but <laughs> 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 question was uh, left you can say something you, you can say something positive here I heard RDR. I heard RDR. Uh, maybe they say positive. There will be there will be more mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the, the end is more positive, and that is like what Dr. Mayapal sir said. If we stay alive this year, yeah, we can we can uh, make it up in all the years to come. So that is the only thing uh, which can be said. So Gopal. Yeah. would want to say so, something yeah yeah so uh, thank you very much uh, sir uh, dr mahipal president of the aios dr lalit vice president of the aios and my teachers uh, dr lalit and dr namrata secretary of the uh, aios mohan sir uh, rdr sir and uh, kaushik thank you very much it has been a very nice discussion and lot of our questions got answered and actually the population of india is huge and we don't actually right now know the way uh, our graph is going to take after the lockdown 4 is going to get over so if the economic activities continue and if the covid increase whatever we have said today may we may have to digest it again so it may change so it's a very dynamic thing uh, keep on changing so uh, let us call it a day today Thank you I very think, much, Gopal. I think we should thank Entod and that their yeah, technical yeah, team yeah. for the. Entod has been tirelessly support. working yeah. on this for the last three days, and uh, they did a Facebook live, using YouTube live, and in the web link. And we have more than 550 participants watching this, and I think all of them have gone back with uh, uh, wonderful uh, answers. Their pitch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you very much. Thank you. 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 Th